So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. I feel slightly humbled after the last three talks. So welcome. So my name is Ram Prakash. I'm a consultant hematologist at Poole Hospital, and I've been a consultant for just over five years now. So I'm just going to give you a very brief um, kind of introduction to CLL, um, go through the basics of blood cells to start with, and then a little bit about prognostics at the end. I might skip over the last few slides because I think I'm not going to have time to go through them. So, normal, normal maturation of white cells. So, what is leukemia? So, leukemia is a cancer of the white cells. And I thought we'd just go through how white cells normally mature. So, the initial cell is a pluripotent stem cell. And these self renew so they can make more of themselves. And then they differentiate into different types of white cells. So you've got your myeloid cells to the left and your lymphoid cells to the right. And the CLL, the, the abnormal cell in CLL is a B lymphocyte. So pluripotent stem cell differentiates depending on the hormones that are, are, um, the cell is, is kind of attracted to. And then it differentiates into to the myeloid cells and then the lymphoid cells. I say the, the, the abnormal cell in CLL is a particular type of, of B lymphocytes. If we come over to the other types of cells, and I think in the, in the jargon, the, 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 the normal values are there. The neutrophils are kind of part of the innate kind of immunity. So they're the, the first type of immune cells that, that we developed kind of during natural evolution. Um, and they're really important in fighting off bacterial infections. The red cells are important in carrying oxygen around the body. And then the, the, the platelets and the platelet precursors are called megakaryocytes are basically bits of cells that are important in forming blood clots. So the purpose of a B cell is to produce immunoglobulins and um, it's a I mean the, the cell that produces that is a, a plasma cell right at, at the end there. So leukemia is a cancer of white blood cells, and there are, there are different types of leukemia, and they're very different. So there's acute leukemia, which happens very quickly, and chronic leukemia, which happens over a long period of time. And then they can be further categorized into the myeloid leukemias or, or lymphoid leukemia. So chronic lymphocytic leukemia, cancer of the white cells affecting the lymphocytes, and it's a chronic condition occurring over a long period of time. So, lymphocytes, they're types of white cells. There are different subtypes, and, and the different subtypes can produce different, if that's a cell of origin, they can produce different types of, of cancers. Um, so, there are natural killer cells, which are part of, again, of our innate immunity, which um, release cytotoxins and directly destroy cells. There are T cells, which, again, directly kill cells, but also are important in forming memory cells and regulating immune response. And then B cells, which are the cells that marks, which are the cells that produce antibodies, which mark cells ready for killing. So often, as the previous talks have suggested, um, CLL is often picked up incidentally, and, and, and patients often have a raised lymphocyte count. And, and as hematologists, we'll have a look at a blood film. And, and, and this is a blood film it's very typical of someone with CLL. It's a very mature looking um, white cells that are very similar in size to the red cells next door, um, and that's a characteristic kind of appearance of a, a, a CLL cell. And that gives us an inkling that this could be CLL. We then go on to do kind of further tests. So CLL is an abnormal clonal B cell population. So it's a cancerous um, cl um, proliferation of these abnormal cells. And, and this is thought to be caused by genetic changes, so acquired genetic changes. The vast majority, we, we think, happen by chance, um, although there is a very small proportion where there, there, there may be an inherited component or an inherited risk factor. So they, you acquire these genetic kind of abnormalities, and these cells divide more than normal and are less prone to death. These cells then accumulate and proliferate, and they lie in the blood, they can lie in the bone marrow, and the lymphoid tissue, so causing enlarged lymph glands and enlarged spleens. So to make a diagnosis of CLL, you need to have 
a, a white cell counter or a lymphocyte counter greater than five with a characteristic kind of cell markers. And, and we do that by, by, by sending off um, bl the blood to, to test for these surface proteins. And if you ever hear us, hear us talking about immunophenotyping, um, it's basically testing the, your, your white cells for these surface proteins. And, and CLL tends to have a very characteristic pattern. So to, to make CLL, or to make, give us a diagnosis of CLL, often patients will have a score of five out of five or four out of five. If, it, if it's less than that, then we may look for alternative uh, diagnosis in terms of what this could be. Is this another type of cancer, not CLL? Just thought I'd briefly go through kind of other terminology in terms of your reading. So if you ever read something about, uh, if you ever see kind of a monoclonal B cell lymphocytosis, um, so there's an increase in B cells that mark like CLL. You have the same surface proteins as CLL, but your lymphocyte count is less than five. Now, what we don't know is whether this is a normal variant, because it's extremely common, particularly as you get older, but the vast majority of people will have a this, this will be a precursor to developing CLL itself. And then SLL is small lymphocytic leukemia. So it's really the same disease, but rather than affect the blood, um, there's pre preferential um, involvement of the lymph nodes. And about 10% of patients present with, with lymphadenopathy rather than blood involvement. But if you do a bone marrow biopsy, that it is normally involved. You just don't have it, have a lymphocyte, kind of a raised lymphocyte count in the blood. So, it, CLL, although it's rare, is the most common leukemia. The average age is 72. Um, it's very rare to get it under 40, but about 10% of patients are under 55. It affects more men than women, about two to one. I say there is potentially an increased risk of getting CLL if you have a first degree relative. So about 10% of patients will have first degree relative with CLL. Probably about 30 or 40% of patients with uh, CLL present without any symptoms. So it's an incidental finding. So you have the blood test for whatever other reason and they find that your, your lymph site count is raised. And it seems to be commoner in, in white populations. So it's very rare in Asia. It's very rare in African populations as well, although we don't know whether that's because the life expectancy in, in Africa is, is lower, whether it's just a, kind of an aging phenomenon, but it's definitely less common kind of in, kind of in the Asian continent. So progression of CLL is normally associated with, with tumor bulk, so it's about the tumor load, um, and that causes symptoms. And, and whilst it's incurable, it is manageable, and the natural history of CLL is one of a relapsing, remitting one over, over years and decades. So, as I said, the, for significant proportions, CLL is um, made by an incidental finding. Lots of GPs are doing kind of routine blood for other things, and they're finding patients have kind of an isolated lymphocytosis, and then the diagnosis of CLL is made. But patients can, can present with, with systemic symptoms. So they can be nonspecific. So fatigue is, is extremely common and very difficult to, to, to treat. Um, fevers, general malaise, and, increase, and reduced exercise tolerance, and that's independent of their, their, their hemoglobin. You can present with recurrent infections, particularly viral infections, but also kind of bacterial infections or fungal infections, particularly if you're on steroids. You can present with lymphadenopathy, so enlarged lymph glands, splenomegaly, and this can be reasonably significant, so mild to moderate enlarged spleens in about half of patients. A small proportion will, will get an enlarged liver or hepatomegaly. And as the CLL progresses, you can get bone marrow failure. So the normal function of a bone marrow is to produce the cells in the blood, so your red cells, your white cells, and your platelet. And as this is being replaced by the CLL cells, you can become anemic, so a low hemoglobin, or your, your platelet count can drop. 
Now, it can also, there is an increased risk of autoimmune complications, and Dr. McCarthy is going to discuss this this afternoon. So there is an increased risk of hemolysis, so the, the breakdown of red cells due to an immune problem or an autoimmune thrombocytopenia or an immune destruction of your plate. So, in terms of the clinical course for someone with, with early stage CLL, so it's a rule of thirds. So, about a third will have very indolent con, con, disease course so, and never require treatment. About a third will slowly progress, so the white count will, will continue to, to go up over kind of a long period of time and will eventually require treatment. And about a third have a, an aggressive clinical course. So they present early with a, a lymphocytosis, but they progress quite quickly afterwards. There is also a risk of something called a rictus transformation or a high-grade transformation. And if you've heard about the previous talks, I think that's why we do the PET scans, is to look for evidence of a high-grade transformation. Has this transformed from an indolent condition, CLL, to a more um, aggressive condition, like a, a high-grade lymphoma? So, in terms of staging, so there are two kind of staging categories, the RI score or the BNA score, and that's depending on, so the, the RI score is a stage 0 to, to 4, and stage 0 is whether you have a, a lymph cell counter greater than 5, and, and it progresses um, to bone marrow failure for stage 4, where your platelets are less than 100. And an early stage is associated with a very good prognosis, Clearly, if you're, if you're stage four, you've clearly got a lot of tumor bulk and the prognosis is less good. Now, these staging criteria and kind of overall survival data are pre-novel therapy. So these are quite old figures. So things are changing, um, and I don't think we can read too much in, in those values just to say that, that it's important for staging. Or staging is important because it, it, it guides us as, as to whether you actually need treatment or not, or or whether you can continue on, on a watch and wait strategy. So probably the easier one to remember is the BNA staging. So stage A if you, is if you've got a, a lymphocytosis with less than three lymphoid areas affected. Stage B is if you have more th uh, than three lymphoid areas. And stage C is if you're anemic with a hemoglobin less than 100, or thrombocytopenic, or platelets are less than 100 due to bone marrow failure. So there is no evidence that treating CLL early before symptoms arise is helpful. And indeed, there was a trial a little while ago now comparing a watch and wait strategy with chlorambucil, which was the standard of care at the time. And actually, patients who had chlorambucil possibly did slightly worse than those that were on a watch and wait strategy, probably due to the complications of, of the treatment. Um, as we've as we've heard, it can be very psychologically kind of difficult, and I think um, days like today are particularly helpful in terms of of finding kind of peer support and looking for for avenues to to to, to discuss kind of the, the, the strategy uh, and look for ways of, of of dealing with it. So when so when do we actually start treatment though? Then. So these are the indications to start treatment from, from a watch and wait strategy to, to, to requiring treatment. So I'm, going to t I'm going to say very little about the actual treatment kind of regimens because that will come at a later, later stage. I think Dr. Wallace is going to discuss that. So we're just going to discuss why you need treatment. So that's because of symptomatic um, kind of in involvement. Um, so it can be disease related. So if you've got weight loss, uh, which is unintentional over a period of six months. Fatigue, as I say, fatigue is, is, is quite a common um, symptom of CLL, and it can be quite profound. Fevers, greater than 38 degrees for more than two weeks. Night sweats for greater than, than one month. 
was another slide there, sorry. Um, and, 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 and if you've got involvement of, of extra nodal um, um, tissue, so if you've got involvement of the skin or kidneys or lung, particularly if it's affecting function, then, then, then we would, would start treatment. So infection is a, is a very common problem in someone with CLL. So the CLL clone has a significant effect on the normal immune system with lower levels of the normal protective antibodies. And in terms of preventing infection, what the guidelines suggest are that you have an annual influenza vaccination, a pneumococcal um, and a haemophilus B vaccination at diagnosis, and if your immunoglobulins are low, so if your IgG level is less than five, and you have recurrent infections, particularly if you require um, hospitalization, then we could consider giving you intravenous immunoglobulins. We also prevent infection if you've had particular types of chemotherapy. So we know that um, drugs like fidarabin and bendamustine affect your T cells, which are a subtype of, of, of lymphocytes and that makes you more prone to getting things like shingles and, and, and a complication called PCP or pneumocystis. So a little bit about then prognosis. So many different factors influence outcome. So there are patient factors such as age, gender, and comorbidity. So that's your other medical problems. So disease factors, such as the clinical stage that you're in, how, whether we picked it up early or at a late stage. There are uh, kind of biological markers, and we'll discuss that in a, in a little while. And then treatment factors. So whether you've responded to treatment or whether you've tolerated treatment and actually can have, have the treatment on offer. So there's a whole variety of prognostic markers that we can use. As I say, there's clinical kind of... Um, features, so your staging. Often if you have a, a kind of a, an atypical CLL score, so you've got a CLL score of three, but doesn't fit with, a, with any other type of leukemia, then that, that can be a poor prognostic sign. We, what we do is look at the, the lymphocyte count and how quickly it doubles. So if it goes up in 50% in two months or doubles in less than six months, and that's a poor sign. If you haven't responded to chemotherapy, so the first line treatment, um, at the moment, if you aren't P53 deleted or, or mutated, it's fludarabin. So clearly, if you don't respond to fludarabin, then you have a poorer prognosis. There are markers that we can use that, 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 that confer prognosis, so things like your beta-2M, your LDH. There are surface proteins like CD38, which is, again, a, a marker on the, on the cell surface of, of CLL lymphocytes, and ZAP70 can confer slightly poor prognosis. I'm just going to briefly discuss about the heavy gene rearrangement, particularly because a lot of the research done for that is based here in Bournemouth by Terry Hamlin and David Osier. But, but P53 kind of is, is a biggie because that, that changes kind of your, your treatment paradigm. So, so, immuno, so the immunoglobulin heavy gene, gene rearrangement. So, the B cells are kind of generated in your bone marrow, and then to make the antibody, you need a specific kind of lock and key mechanism. So we do that by pr producing lots of different antibodies, um, and there'll be one with the, with the greatest um, fit. And we do that by rearranging these kind of variable regions called the VDJ rearrangements um, to, to fight off infections. So if, you are, if your CLL cells are mutated, uh, if your CLLs have a heavy gene um, mutation, then they, are, um, they <coughs> are further developed, whereas if they're unmutated, then, then they are um, at a kind of earlier stage in, in differentiation. So particularly if you're in pool, if, you, if you're kind of entered on the, the South Coast trial, um, we, we can find out whether you are heavy gene re rearranged or not. Um, and, 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 and the clinicians do get those results back. back. So if you are heavy chain rearranged, then often you have a much, sl a much more slow-growing disease. A, a large proportion of patients never need treatment. And if you do need treatment, actually response rates to FCR are very good, and you see very long-lasting kind of remissions. Um, so 
about 60 or 70 percent of patients who need treatment and have FCR will remain in remission 10 years down the line, and they're less likely to develop other genetic abnormalities. If you're unmutated, however, your prognosis is, is lower, but still very good. The, the pace, the, it is a much faster pace of disease, and often you will need treatment. And, and when you do have treatment, the responses can be shorter, and you're more likely to accrue these other genetic abnormalities. So, chromosomes. Um, so, we, when we talk about cytogenetics, we are looking at the cytogenetics of your bone marrow, and these are these are these are in the abnormal CLL clone. So, this is someone with normal chromosomes in kind of in all your cells. Um, so, 40, 46 chromosomes. And then if you have a look at, so we talked about 17P or P53. So the P is a short arm of, of the chromosome and Q is a long arm of the chromosome. And I think the one thing stands out in terms of prognosis is, is, is that deletion of 17P because that's associated with, with abnormalities kind of in, in P53. And there are some mutations that can confer actually quite a good prognosis. So if you've got a deletion 13Q, then your prognosis is often very good, even better than if your cell genetics were normal. Um, and, and deletion 11Q is the, is the ATM mutation. And so what we do is, if you talk about fish, um, they're looking at particular probes that will pick up these, these genetic abnormalities. And this one is a probe for chromosome 12, um, and, and, the, and, and in the picture to the right, that that, that, that patient has a trisomy 12 because there's three copies of, of, of chromosome 12. So P53 okay, um, is located on chromosome 17. So, to, so gen, because all of us will have 25,000 genes in the body, and P53 signals cell death if a cell is damaged. So if you do have a, a cancerous cell. Then, then P53 is involved in surveillance and, and, and killing that, that cell. So if the P53 is damaged or, or is missing, then the cell won't die and it can then proliferate. And it's, it's, a, it's an abnormality that is found in, in lots of other cancers, and not just CLL, but, but does often confer poor prognosis and poorer responses to chemotherapy. But again, as, as was said in the previous talks, things are changing with, with novel therapies and our standard high risk kind of abnormalities may not be the same with, 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 with newer drugs. Um, and that's just um, a, um, a graph to show that, that patients who do have a P53, particularly if you've got Two mutations do do kind of less well than if you don't. So, so if you do have a P53 mutation, the treat this is important, and all clinicians will will test for this, as as you have poorer responses to to standard chemotherapy, so it's poorer responses to FCR or BR chemotherapy. And, and that's important for the FLARE trial, so that's a standard um, tr trial for a younger patient, because if you are P53 mutated, then you can't enter the FLARE trial because FCR is still one of the arms of treatment. So in the UK, NICE has approved a brutinib in the first line setting, um, although a portion of patients can have a combination of rituximab and, and idolelizib. And as I said before, the conventional high-risk features may not be so important in the era of these new novel therapies. But only about 50% of patients that don't respond to fludarabine do have a P53 mutation. So what accounts for the rest? So there's been a massive improvement in gene sequencing over the last um, few years. And, and, and there, are, there are recurrent mutations that, that we see that, that do confer a, a poorer prognosis. Um, um, these, at the moment, they don't change what we treat you with, but, but, but I think our knowledge about CLL is advancing at pace, uh, and these are three of the, the more common kind of mutations that are picked up with, with patients with um, CLL, particularly with, associated with poorer responses. So, 
just very briefly, um, about 10% of patients have a notch one uh, mutation, oh, uh, um, and a proportion of those will be f refractory to standard treatment, and they have a higher risk of developing called a rictus transformation. And there are drugs in clinical trial targeting this pathway. And as you can see, those with a kind of a notch one have actually is quite a similar prognosis to those with a, a P53 kind of mutation. And if you've got both of them, you don't do particularly well. And I think that's kind of in the area of novel therapies. That's where we should be kind of looking for for new drugs. So SF3B1 mutations again, not a small proportion of patients with CLL, um, but you see it in the more aggressive states of CLL very rarely seen in, in very early stage CLL or, or MBL. Again, associated with a, a slightly poor prognosis. Oddly, it's also associated with another bone marrow condition called minor dysplasia. But again, there are preclinical pre developments looking into inhibitors targeting that pathway. Again, as you can see, if you're mutated, it confers a, a poorer prognosis than, than if you've kind of got a normal or a wild type um, mutation. And then lastly, again, there's this mutation called the BEC3. It's often associated with ATM mutations. Again, it's, it's present in the more aggressive um, d d disease courses. Again, a proportion of those that don't respond have a mutation involving BEC3.